Thank you all so much, all of you, for coming out tonight. It's really great to see you. Uh, and I'm now for the post JavaScript apocalypse. Uh, I need to explain this title. There are some experts who say I, that this title is wrong, that I should call it the put JavaScript apocalypse. <laughs> and there are other experts who say, no, no, it's the hatch of JavaScript apocalypse. And this confusion post put in patch is due to HTTP. HTTP is the hypertext transport protocol. It's what the web uses to move documents and data around. And it has three verbs in it. And they seem to be synonyms. They all mean the same thing. And often they do the same thing, but there are a few cases where the experts say, no, if you use the wrong one, disaster will occur. It's the end of the world awfulness. And that makes it really hard to use. I think in a well-designed system, there should be one. Or if there are more, it should be obvious which one is the correct one to use. But having all this mess in the protocol, I see that as a symptom of clutter. Clutter is when you've got too much stuff, and it's not well organized, and it gets in the way and slows things down. So in our lives, we can think of life as the acquisition of stuff. Every day we go out and we work and we get money and we use that money to buy stuff. And our homes start to fill up with stuff and stuff and we get more and more stuff. And we think of the value of the stuff that we have in terms of its acquisition cost or maybe its cost of replacement. But often the stuff we have actually has negative value. For example, you might have some stuff that's really valuable to you but you can't find it because you've got other stuff that's in the way. So the stuff that's in the way is decreasing the value of other things. Sometimes you've got stuff piled on top of other stuff, and the stuff on top is literally destroying the stuff that's on the bottom. So having too much stuff can actually decrease the quality of your life. And so you want to manage it. You want to get rid of it. And it turns out there is an authority on how to organize stuff and how to remove clutter. It's a wonderful Japanese woman named Marie Kondo, or Komari. She is, I think, the world's greatest living authority on how to make a home a nice place to be. She's really good at organizing things and filing and putting things away. She's great. So one of the things she teaches is how to figure out how to get rid of stuff. And what she'll do is she'll go into a room and she'll pull everything out of the closets, out of the drawers, off of the shelves, and put it in the middle of the room. And then she will go piece by piece, pick up each thing, and she will ask her a question. She'll say, Tokimeku desu Which means, do you throb? Do you vibrate? You know, does it give some signal that this is something important to me? And if not, you should get rid of it. You should put it on eBay, or you should recycle it, or gift it to somebody, or you know, get, get rid of it. But if it, you know, if it vibrates, then that means it has value to you and something you to keep. Now, when she's teaching in English, she doesn't say throb or vibrate because it makes some people giggle. <laughs> so instead, she says, does it spark joy? Which is delightful, right? So you pick the thing up, does it spark joy? What does that mean? Well, it, it must mean something to you if it does, and if it does, then you'll keep it. So I want to apply her strategy for organizing things and getting rid of clutter to our programming systems. Unfortunately, as much as I love the concept of spark joy, it doesn't work because we love all of the stuff. <laughs> you can look at, you know, one of the worst programming languages in the world, say JavaScript, for example. There, it is full of more bad parts than any other language, and yet there are people who love every feature of the language. Not, you won't find any one person who loves all the features, but there is no feature that is not loved by somebody. Every feature sparks joy. So when we start looking at the design of the web and the internet and computers in general and everything, spark joy is not enough for deciding how to get rid of stuff. So we need other criteria for the 
clean things up and make it easier for us to do the stuff that we need to do. So, um, yeah, so I want to get rid of the clutter and programming. We've got too much clutter. If we can get rid of the clutter, the systems will be much more straightforward. We won't be arguing about put and post. It should be obvious how to do the right thing, and then we can spend more of our time doing the right thing and not having to undo the consequences of having done the wrong thing. So I'm going to start by looking at ASCII. ASCII is one of the fundamental things that we all work with every day. It's the American Standard Code for, for Information Interchange. It was originally designed for teletypes, but it then became the standard character set for computers. It still exists today as the first 128 characters of Unicode, so it's around us all the time. But it was designed at a different time for a different purpose, and it's full of clutter. So let's look at some of the things in it. For example, it has tab and space. Space came from the space bar, the thing you press on the typewriter to move the carriage one click over. Tab, which was short for tabulate, would release the carriage and let it swing freely until it was obstructed by a physical tab stop. You would set little screws on the carriage which would prevent it from moving when you press the tab key. And the ASCII set includes that. Um, because they wanted to do at least everything that a typewriter could do. But they didn't consider what a tab stop was. They didn't provide any way of defining tab stops. There was no default for how much a default tab stop should be. And so <coughs> we still argue about how big should tabs be, or even should we have tabs at all. And it's a pointless argument, which is just a tremendous waste of time. And it's because of this clutter that we have two character codes that do kind of the same thing, that are almost interchangeable, but not quite, and so we argue about them all the time. And that arguing is a huge waste, and the value of having both of them is no value. It's just total negative. So have that, any of you seen Silicon Valley? <laughs> You need to buy HBO, HBO and get Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is the best TV show ever made about programming. It's really, really good. It's about this guy, Richard Hendricks, who is a good programmer, and his adventure is in trying to start a software company in California. And he's a brilliant guy. He works really hard. In fact, he works so much that he can't find a girlfriend. You, you, you probably know the type, or maybe you are the type. So um, anyway, in season three, he finally finds someone. And she's great. She's smart. She's nice. She's a programmer. She seems to like him for some reason. But she uses spaces instead of tabs. <laughs> And it makes Richard crazy. It turns out <laughs> his affection for an invisible control character is greater than anything he could ever feel for another human being. And so he destroys their relationship. So you know, clearly having tab and space has caused so much human misery. And I want to end it tonight. So this is my proposal. I want to get rid of one of them. And I can't get rid of space. So we're getting rid of tab. <laughs> <laughs> From this moment forward, tab does not spark joy. <laughs> All right, so uh, ASCII also gave us two quote marks, the single quote and the double quote. And JavaScript uses both of these, and it uses them to do both to do exactly the same thing. And so that leads to arguments about which one should we use, and complicated rules about when we should use one or the other. I invented a set of rules that I thought made sense. When I saw other people had different rules, which made just as much sense, and there was no mechanical way of determining if it was being used correctly by any set of rules. So I finally decided, this is clutter. We don't need two of these, we should just have one. So I'm going to get rid of one of them, the one I'm going to get rid of is the single quote because it is overloaded as apostrophe, right? So it, it, 
causes problems if you're writing contractions or possessives in English. So we we'll just use double quote for strings because it sparks joy. <coughs> uh, ASCII introduced the idea of separate codes for uppercase and lowercase. So the original design for ASCII was it was going to be a six-bit character set, which means it could, it could contain at most 64 characters. And so there wasn't enough space in the character set to represent both uppercase and lowercase. But typewriters could. And the way typewriters did it was they had a shift key. So the committee that was creating ASCII decided we'll have two shift codes, one for shifting up and one for shifting down. And that's how you'll get uppercase and lowercase. And that would have worked. But they decided not to do that. And the reason they did that was that at the time, <coughs> teletypes would communicate over noisy telephone lines. And if you got hit with some line noise, a character could get garbled and turn into some weird noise character when it got received on the other end. And so it was common for teletype printouts to have typos in them because of the line noise. And their concern was that if the shift character gets garbled, then the rest of the page is going to look stupid. And it's going to look like we started shouting, right, for you know, some missed out. So for that reason, they decided they would add a seventh bit to ASCII, moving it up to 128 characters, and give a separate code for each of the lowercase characters. That had never happened before. All character sets prior to ASCII just had letters. And that would actually have been better for us, because we have this, we would have, determine case in exactly the same way that we today determine color and style and slant and decoration, all of that stuff. Case would just be another one of those. But we didn't do that because of the influence of ASCII. So as a result, we now have case sensitivity, which is a concept that never existed before that. So I would really like to go back and fix ASCII, but it is too late. We're, we're, we're stuck with it. And so we're going to have this uppercase, lowercase thing, I think, until extinction. So <laughs> that's, that's a bit of clutter that we'll just never get rid of. JavaScript in ES6 added the let statement, which is, a, is an alternative to the var statement. The difference is let respects block scope, which isn't really all that important that you can write good programs with bar, you can write good programs with let. The advantage of let is it doesn't confuse the Java guy so much. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's actually value in having those guys be less confused. So, we don't need two of them. We only need one, so I'd say the one we should keep is the let. We don't need the bar. Unless you have to run on <coughs> Internet Explorer, but we shouldn't do that anymore. Stop, stop writing for Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer does not spark joy. <laughs> um, so we have const now, which is a companion to let, which um, creates a variable that you cannot then assign to. But a lot of people get confused about the difference between const and, and freeze. And it's a really important difference. You know, one applies to variables and the other applies to values. It's my opinion that you shouldn't be able to get a JavaScript license unless you understand the difference between const and freeze. So get on that. JavaScript has two bottom values. A bottom value is something which represents nothingness. And there's some argument among language designers, should we even have a bottom value? But there is nobody who thinks you should have two of them. <laughs> <laughs> and JavaScript has two of them. They are not interchangeable. They are slightly different. But if you have two things which look to be the same, which sometimes are interchangeable, but sometimes not, that is a source of errors and problems. This is clutter. I want to get rid of one. Usually the one I would get rid of is the one that is longer. <laughs> but in this case, I have to get rid of null. 
we've, we've got problems with null in this language. Type of null is object, which is completely broken, and that's never going to get fixed. If you're using undefined and not null, that's never going to be an issue. So unfortunately, we have undefined. Now, the concept of null, null is a, it has the concept of a null pointer as a <coughs> programming language is due to Tony Hoare, a brilliant British programmer who proposed the idea of having a pointer value which represents nothing. He has since determined that that was a mistake. He <laughs> calls it a billion dollar mistake. And he did that by estimating the cost of all of the accumulated null pointer exceptions that have ever happened. <laughs> They're all his fault. And he's really sorry about it. So, but you know, we're stuck with it in JavaScript. But hopefully, someday, after JavaScript, we'll have a better language which won't have null, which works as a, a pointer. What I think makes more sense is null as an immutable empty object. And in JavaScript today, it's possible to make such a thing. We make a const, which would be an object which is empty that inherits nothing, which we would freeze. So if you go to that object and ask for a property and it doesn't have it, the rule of property access in JavaScript says that you get the undefined value, which I would like to fix and say, no, you get this new kind of null value instead. And so if you have a long dotted expression, it doesn't matter if at some point you run out of objects and it stops. You know, you can go down the whole thing, and even if it doesn't make sense, we'll just get null at the end, which is just what you should get. So I'd like to see this in the next language, whatever that might be. <coughs> so functional programming is suddenly becoming a really big thing. And it's because functional programming solves some of the problems that we're now having in distributed systems. So it's good stuff. It took a long time for it to get to the mainstream, but it's finally starting to happen. And a lot of it is due to JavaScript. JavaScript was the first language to bring lambdas in the way that Scheme did them to the mainstream, which was great. But there's a more extreme version of functional programming, which is pure functional programming, where you have <coughs> analogies of functions to mathematical functions. Mathematical functions are not really about computation, they're about mapping, of mapping one set of values to another set. And in those sorts of functions, there can be no side effects. There's no mutation. Nothing is changing. We're just discovering what the values of things are. And so the idea is we bring that to programming. So in, in that world, a given input to a function will always yield exactly the same output which is not true for most of the functions that we write, but in this pure model, it has to be like that. So there's no mutation allowed, no side effects, nothing changes. All we do is discover values. So why would we do that? First reason is testability. If you give a certain input to a function and it always gives you exactly the same output, always guaranteed, then testing becomes a whole lot easier because you don't need to worry about the context of anything. Because no matter how you call it, no matter when you call it, it should return the same thing. So your testing burden should go way, way, way down. Composability. Now, in, when you have pure functions, it's possible to compose functions together in really interesting, very powerful ways. Things which make us much more expressive, much more productive. That's really good stuff. And maybe the best reason to be interested in this <coughs> is parallelism. That you might want to have multiple things going on at the same time. That's how we make things faster. And in conventional mutating languages, like Java, for example, you try to do that with threads, but there's a really big problem. If a thread is mutating, if it does read, modify, write memory, and another thread is trying to access that same memory at the same time, you get races happening. And if you try to prevent that with, with synchronization, you get deadlocks, which can kill your systems. All of that is really, really bad stuff. But if you never mutate, then all the threads could be running at full speed all the time with no races, no deadlock, no nothing. Everything goes really fast. So it's a way to make our languages go faster. So Q 
can you write this way in JavaScript? Turns out, yeah, you can. You just need to remove the impurities of the language. We don't have to add anything to JavaScript to get pure functions. We just have to remove the stuff that's not pure. For example, the date function. Every time you call the date function, it, it gives you a different day, right? That, that's, that's not a pure function, so we have to get rid of that. The random function. Every time you call random, you get a different number, so that's got to go. Uh, the delete operator, that mutates objects. We can't be mutating objects, so that's got to go. Object assign and any other built-in methods that modify objects. Can't have those, those aren't pure. And there are similar methods that do the same thing to arrays. <clears throat> the sort method in JavaScript, unfortunately, mutates the array. It didn't have to. It could have been defined to create a new array, which is sorted, but it didn't, so that's got to go. Uh, regular expressions, or complex regular expression, uh, execution, that's got some state that changes the regular expression object so that you can't have that. Assignment, so we got to get rid of assignment. So the equal sign, I, I never liked the equal sign as the assignment operator anyway, so it's good that we're getting rid of that. Bar statement, can't have bars, because things can't be changing, can't have let either. Const is okay, const is actually great. So that means that you can put a value into a variable once, so you know, get it right, and get it in there, and, and you're done. So const is good. For statement, can't have for statements because it wants to change an induction variable. That's mutating, gotta get rid of that. Users, turns out every time you <laughs> don't do something different. Humans are not, can't be, we don't map mathematically, they just don't compute. So gotta get rid of the users, and gotta get rid of the network, because it turns out every time you go out on the network, something else could happen, so we've got to get rid of that. So the problem with the pure model is that it doesn't respect the fact that the universe is mutated. And so we need some sort of hybrid model. And there's a debate going on right now about where the, the dividing line is. But what's clear is that we should try to have purity wherever we can, as much as we can, for all of the benefits that we get from purity. And then for the places where we have to interact with the world, then we'll do the, the dirty stuff. You know, an account balance cannot be a mathematical constant, right? It, it's got to be able to change somehow. Uh, generators were added to ES5, and I think that was a mistake, because they weren't necessary. But the gener generators that ES6 added are too complicated. They've got weird, nasty syntax. And they, they change the model of the language, and you don't even need them. All you need to do with generators is a function that returns a function. If you can handle that, you can do much better on your own. So let me demonstrate that. So to make a generator, you have a factory function. A factory function is a thing that makes generators, and it can have parameters. You can pass stuff into it to customize the generator that it's going to make. You then declare your generator state variables, and you return the generator function. And the generator function will compute a new value based on what the current state variable is, and modify the state variable, and return a new value. That's it. That's all you need. So here's an example. This is the element function. The element function, or the element factory, creates a generator which takes an array, and each time you call the generator, it will return the next element of the array. And it's really easy. So we've got a counter which tells us where we are in the array that is in the scope of the uh, factory, but the generator function closes over it, so it has access to it. That's flexible closure. That's great. That's the best feature ever put in a programming language. And JavaScript was the, the language that brought that idea to the mainstream. So we should use it. So if we haven't reached the end of the array yet, we'll get the next value from the array. We'll increment i, return the value. That's a generator. Really easy stuff. Uh, callbacks are a really important thing. They are how we manage 
asynchronicity in our language. Um, often they're misused because they're a low-level thing. You need to put higher-level stuff on top of them in order to make them work well. But as a fundamental mechanism, they are essential and important. But there's a problem. A function that takes a callback or a continuation receives an extra argument. And that argument is the function to call when you know the result of whatever this is, That's what callbacks do. And there are two places where you can put it in a parameter list. It could be the first thing, or it could be the last thing. So you could do it either way. So as a result of that, people do it both ways. Right? Because you can, and that's clutter. So anytime we give people an option to do what might be a wrong thing, we'll do it and then defend our rights to do the wrong thing. <laughs> and, and then they'll argue about it. And the basis of the argument is nobody knows what the right thing is, so you know, pick something and maybe it's right. But it turns out ES5, no, ES6 told us what the right answer is. If we have a variable number of arguments, then we want to use the new ellipsis operator, and that says the callback has to be first, because ellipsis wants to gather everything that's last. So that's it. So, Anybody who's doing it wrong, you're on notice. You um, <laughs> need to fix that. Call back to that first. Uh, uh, promises were added in ES6. Um, I think they were a mistake. Promises were discovered or invented in a company that I founded many years ago called Electric Communities in a language called E. And they were a brilliant mechanism for doing distributed and secure programming. And they somehow leaped from from E into Python and then into JavaScript. And unfortunately, in the process of that migration, it mutated into this weird kind of limited, nasty thing. I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, but it's there, and there are a lot of people using it. But it was not designed to manage asynchronicity, which is the thing that we're using it for. I recommend instead using RQ, which was a library that I wrote. <laughs> It has four functions in it, so it's not a big library, but it can deal with the sequences and doing things in parallel and races and all that. It's really easy to use and straightforward if you understand how to write a function that can return a function. And I assume you all know how to do that now, but I just showed you how to do it. Uh, syntax, <coughs> the most controversial part of programming language design, it turns out syntax really doesn't make much difference. The important thing is the semantics. What does the language actually empower you to do? But most of us don't understand that. We have a deeply emotional relationship with this syntax. And we will argue about it, and we will defend the stuff which is actually causing us problems. And there's no end to it. it it's fashion. It, you know, it's, it seems strange that Fashion dominates the most nerdly of all the arts. But it, it does. Programming language design and syntax, it's just fashion. It's not substance. So let's look at some syntax through the ages. Yes, yes, yes. So the first one there is Fortran 4. That was my first programming language. Yes. Fortran was created before lowercase was discovered. So <laughs> everything was written in lowercase back then. In Fortran, spaces were not significant. So, ifa and if a looked the same to Fortran. So, in order, in order to separate the if part, they required the use of the parents just to separate the components of the statement. Um, they had that uh, eq operator for determining, you know, for saying is a equal to b, which is nice. But they introduced the terrible, terrible idea of using the equal sign for assignment. You know, they should have been using equal sign for equality. Right? That's what equal sign is for. BCPL was the first good parts language. BCPL was, or began as a subset of CPL, which was a language that was designed by a committee that got way too big and complicated. And a brilliant designer took it and made just the good parts. It's the first curly brace language. And 
uh, in his language, spaces are significant, which was well, not a new idea, but it was a good one. He's using the equal sign for equality, which was brilliant. He was using Elval's assignment operator for assignment, which was also brilliant. And he required the use of curly braces in the consequence of the if. This was the first curly brace language, and he did it correctly. <coughs> JavaScript was based on a, a series of languages, or, or Java, C++, C, and then B. B was a, an interpretation of ADCPL, which unfortunately got it wrong, that the parentheses are required and the curly braces around the consequence are optional, which it turned out was a really awful mistake because there are programmers that think, since the compiler doesn't care, I have a right to leave the curly braces out, which means it's likely that errors are going to creep into the code as a result of that. So always put the curly braces in every time, on every if, on every while, Every four, put the curly braces in. Just go. Not <laughs> hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Algol sixty or Algol sixty was the best design by committee of a programming language in the history of the world. In fact, it may be the only successful design by committee of a programming language ever. Um, they just got some brilliant people together and the stars aligned and they did something which really propelled the state of the art. It was really amazing work. It was so successful that they thought, let's do it again. So they brought together another committee of really bright people and created Elval 68, which was not nearly as brilliant as Elval 60 was. It was big, it was complicated, it was bloated, there was just a lot of bad stuff in it. But I really liked their if statement. So um, even though they were modeled after Algol 60, which was the language that introduced blocks to programming, they didn't have blocks. So no, no begin end, no curly braces. Instead, they delimited the if statement with phi. So phi is if backwards. So there's sort of a symmetry to it. And I, I just like that. I think that looks nice to me. Um, also, getting if you look at our programs, particularly in, in all the C-ish languages, especially in JavaScript, we've got so many curly braces that it's really hard to figure out what does this curly brace close. And, and if you leave one out someplace, then matching things up becomes really, really hard. But if your ifs aren't playing that game, if they're made out of a different piece of, of syntax, then the programs become a lot easier to read and manage. So I, I like that. And I think we could make it a little bit better. So I'm hoping in the next language, we can simplify this even further. Uh, I think Python had the right idea in making line, break, line breaks significant. So if line breaks are significant, we don't need the then, and we don't need the semicolon. So we can just slim it down a little bit. And there's a lovely language called Rebel, which used colon as the assignment operator, which I'm thinking looks really, really nice. Like, there's an elegance to that that I like. I also like the elbow, but just a colon. I mean, that, so simple, no clutter there. That, that sparks joy, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's look at the try statement. This is not the way you use try in JavaScript, obviously, because we're smarter than that. This is Java. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And in Java, it's very common to have try with a large number of catches and a final. So we don't need any of that in JavaScript, but Java has it because of the brokenness of its type system. That the, the, the Java heads claim that Java is the superior language of the two because it's got these types and the way it manages the types, not recognizing that, in fact, the types are causing errors in the design of the language itself and in the way the language is used. So the reason they have finally is because they don't, or they didn't have functions. So there was no place where you could put some code which gets run no matter what path you take for this stuff. 
fact, if you look at the design of the JDM and how finally is implemented, it's implemented as a subroutine call return. They didn't expose that to you, so you don't get to use it, but that's what they're doing. But finally, is an implied, uh, an implied function. And I don't like implied stuff generally in programming languages because I like stuff to be explicit. I'd like to be really clear, this is what's going on. I don't want a piece of syntax which is disguising what's going on. I think that actually causes bugs. Then why are there so many catch clauses? It's because of the type system that often there are multiple different kinds of things that might get returned from a function or a method but the type system doesn't allow for that multiple bunch of stuff. It only allows one type to be delivered. But there are other things that you have to deliver that aren't errors, that aren't really exceptions. They're just another thing that sometimes has to be returned. And so they overload the exception mechanism to make up, to compensate for the fact that the types don't work properly. So, yeah, so, that's a mess. So comparing this to how we do it in JavaScript, if you're thinking in JavaScript, you don't do any of that stuff. You, you try something, you'll try plan A. If it works, great, you're done. If it doesn't work, try plan B. You don't even care why plan A didn't work, so you don't even need to look at whatever exception object or error object got passed to you. You don't care, it doesn't matter. It just that didn't work try something else. That's much better. That's a language in which the type system is working for you and not against you. There are other places in the design of Java where you can see the type system failing. So when you're searching for something using index of and you don't find it, Java can't return null, it can't return an object, it can't return anything, it can only return an int. And so they picked an int that they thought was going to be an unlikely place. But this can cause errors, right? You might not expect that something could go negative and you pass it into something else or do some computation with it and you get a really weird error in your code now. What Java or what JavaScript could do, because it's a better language, they could have returned null or undefined in this case, which would have been much better. But um, that didn't happen. Instead, uh, Java was copied. And so things that are wrong in Java's type system somehow infected JavaScript. So let's talk some more about types. Time for a quiz. So you're going to add an int32 to an int32. What is the type of the result? It depends. No, there's actually a right answer. So anybody know? Anyone? Int32? 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 No, that's not correct. It's int33. Yes. Int33 is the right answer. It's because if you add two 32 bit integers, there's a possibility that it's going to roll over and you're going to have an extra bit of significance. And Java is not aware of that. And so there's this idea that the type system is protecting us from mistakes, but it's actually causing mistakes. And this is a pretty nasty mistake, where a number can go wildly negative and without warning or explanation. <coughs> Let's try another one. Int32 times int32. What's the type? <laughs> Anybody? <coughs> In 64, oh, close. It's in 63. <laughs> in 63. But your 64 guess was much better than what Java did. <laughs> it's 31 bits off. You can hide some really significant errors in that. So again, there's this pretense that it's protecting us from errors, but it's actually causing us errors. So this is the most reported bug in JavaScript. And I think this is awful, particularly if you're trying to deal with money, because we count our money in the decimal system, on this planet at least. And you expect this to work, right? And it doesn't, because we're using binary floating. 
And it gets even worse than this. For example, because these are not exact values, associativity is broken, which means the order in which you add things together can change the result, yes. which is appalling. I mean, that, that's extremely bad stuff. So I propose to fix this. Um, with, I'm proposing a new decimal format called DEC64. It is stored in a 64-bit word. It has a 56-bit coefficient. You can turn and a, an 8-bit exponent. I put the exponent on this end because on Intel architecture, you can unpack that for free. You can turn any ordinary int into one of these simply by shifting it 8 bits and storing it this thing. In a software implementation, most integers can be added in five instructions, which sounds like five times more than you would want, except that you also get NAND protection, or NANDs and overflow protection in those five instructions, which is a nice thing to have. In a hardware implementation, two numbers with the same exponent could be added in one cycle. And so that eliminates the performance argument for why we need hints. And it eliminates a large class of errors that hints can have, including the int 63 error. And it fixes the 0.1 plus 0.2 plus equals 0.3 error. So this is what we should have. If there's anybody who's working on the next language, the post JavaScript language, you want to put this into your project. This is an implementation of x64. It's available on GitHub. It runs on, or it's on x64. It's an assembly language. It's as fast as I know how to make it. Um, I imagine that someone else could make it even faster. But it seems to produce correct results, certainly much better results than we're getting in binary floating point. So I think the next language should have this as its only number type. Because if you have multiple number types, you can make errors by choosing the wrong type. That's a source of clutter. We don't need clutter. We need joy. <laughs> so let's talk some more about numbers. What is zero divided by zero? What, what should happen if you try to divide zero by zero? But yeah, it's complicated, right? So if you ask a mathematician, he will likely say it's undefined. And what they mean is not what JavaScript means by undefined. Yeah. What, what they mean is it doesn't even make sense to ask this question. It, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't hear you when you say zero divided by zero. <laughs> it's impossible to happen. But we know as programmers that if there's a way to say it, somehow it'll get set. Right? So <laughs> programs need to deal with that. So what, what should a computer do if you try to divide zero by zero? One argument says it should catch fire. <laughs> because it should never happen, so it doesn't matter that the machine catches fire if it happens, because it doesn't happen, right? Except we know that it does happen. Right? Catching fire will not get us to five nines. It's not what we want to do. Another argument says you should get a nano value. And that's a reasonable thing. That's certainly better probably than catching fire. Another thing says it should be zero. And in fact, for some uh, business applications, zero is the right answer. Zero is what you want. If you didn't sell anything, but you still need to know how much money you made per item, zero is as close as you can get to the reasonable number. The answer you won't mean anybody, mean anything to a business person. One. Well, you know, you've got n over n, right? n over n is 1. I once worked on a mainframe where you got 2. <laughs> it was a computer that was designed by Seymour Cray, maybe the best computer designer in history. And I can imagine the conversation that happened at Control Data. Someone said, Seymour, we just found out when you divide 0 by 0, you get 2. He said, yeah. So, well, I, shouldn't you fix it? He said, no. no. <laughs> I'm not going to fix it. And I'll tell you why. Divide is the slowest construction on this machine. I'm not going to add another cycle to it just for a case that should never happen. I don't want to slow down everybody's division just 
because some idiot wants to divide zero by zero. <laughs> so, and I think he was right, because as far as I know, I am the only person who ever tried that. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so, um, why, why do I care about what zero divided by zero is? It's because I'm actually more concerned with this case. What is zero times n? Any guesses as to what that should be? Zero. Zero, yeah, I think zero is the right answer. And in fact, uh, compiler writers used to use that knowledge so that if they have a multiplication to do and they know that they can determine at compile time that one of the operands is zero, they don't have to evaluate the other operand if it has no side effects, if it's pure. Which is great, because not only does it make the program run faster, it even makes the compiler run faster. So it's a win all around. But that changed when the IEEE floating point standard came along, because it says if n is nan, the answer has to be nan, which means you have to go ahead and compile that code, generate that code, and execute it anyway, and then look at it to see if it's nan. You can't just accept that it's zero. And I think that was wrong. It's slowing things down. The motivation was they wanted to punish the wicked. And anybody who's doing stuff with NANs, they're, they're, they need to be punished. And so we're the NAN But I'm more concerned with making good programs run faster. And I don't want to pay that penalty. I'm, I'm siding with Seymour on this one. I think Seymour got it right. So who writes code that multiplies things by zero anyway? Uh, not a lot of humans do that because we tend to do a lot of pre-optimization, but definitely machines do. So code generators, macro processors, partial evaluators, they definitely do this. And they will generate better, faster programs if we allow them to multiply by zero. Also, it turns out that one of the slowest things you can do in modern CPUs is a conditional jump. We've got so much pipelining going on in the, in the instruction decoding that any time you do a conditional jump, it's like everything stalls and it takes a long time for the computer to get back up to speed again. You can avoid that by using multiplication, where you've got a, you've got a value which is either zero or one. You multiply one thing by that number and you multiply the other thing by that number minus one. And so you can do that stuff you can do two multiplies and a, and a um, decrement, or a subtract, and that and no conditional jumps, so the code actually goes faster. So I would like to allow us to have better idioms for writing our programs. So because of that and related arguments, I want all of these forms to produce zero all the time because that's it, it makes sense, and I'm not interested in punishing anybody. I want to make our programs good and fast, and you know, this is compatible with that. So DEC64, to get back to that, um, does this. So that's another reason why we want DEC64. Reserved words. So reserved words were not in the original languages, but got added later as a consequence of computers with very small memories. For example, the first version of B ran a machine that had a 16K of RAM in it, really, really small. The whole operating system and the compiler had to run in this tiny, tiny space. And so languages did things to make it easier to get work done in these tiny memories. And one of the things was having a reserved word policy so that the compiler doesn't have to reason, what does this collection of letters mean in this context? They can just say, that is always an if statement, so we don't even have to to worry about context. That made them a little smaller. That's not the case anymore. You now have gigabytes of RAM in your pocket. It's likely soon you're going to have terabytes of RAM in your pocket. But we're still thinking about machines that are measured out in K, at least in the way we design our programming languages. So I think we should fix that. Um, but one problem with reserved words is it's a hazard for programmers. If you declare a variable or use a method in it, name or, or parameter name that matches a keyword that you were not aware of, your program's going to fail. 
that, that's annoying. And it's also bad for the people who make languages because they may want to add a new feature, but they can't because if they do, then that's going to break any program that is kind of using that word. So they make up really ugly, nasty looking symbols instead. I mean, you see what C has been doing with that stuff, right? It's really awful because um, they have no alternative because they're stuck with this broken reserve word policy. So one example of what's happened with that is when exceptions were first being proposed, the verb which would cause an exception to happen was raise. We're going to raise an exception. Um, but raise was already being used to raise things to powers and similar things. So they used throw instead because nobody thought throw meant anything useful. So it wasn't used. So that's why we throw exceptions, not raise exceptions. Now most of you have never seen anything except throw, so you gotten used to it, but in fact it was a really bizarre notion when it first came out. So I propose a, a new policy. So if any function, in any function, a word may be used as a language keyword, such as if, or as the name of a variable, but not both. And the programmer gets to choose which one it's going to be. This is good for programmers, because you won't trip over features you don't use. And it's good for language maintainers, because they can add new features without breaking anything. And it turns out you don't need terabytes of memory in order to implement this. It's actually very efficient. Uh, camel case or underbar. This is another of those things. We have two ways that we can make variable names. And because we have two ways, some people will do it one way, some people will do it the other, and then they'll argue about it. And the argument is never going to stop because it turns out, in this case, everybody is wrong. The right answer is names with spaces. <laughs> we have a space bar in ASCII, and we, we can use it. So why, why don't we use names with spaces? It's the same thing. Um, computers used to have tiny memories, and it made it harder to write the compiler. But you know, here's an algorithm where we can very easily adapt. So, We'll start matching words, and we'll pick the longest set of words that seems to match or make sense, and it's an easy thing to implement. So we should do that in the next language. Uh, something which was a brilliant idea that somehow got lost was the idea of contracts, or programming by contract. This was a feature of the Eiffel language. It was brilliant. For any function or any method, you could list preconditions that when this function is called, these things must be true. And if they're not true, then an exception will happen, or they will halt, whatever, catch fire, whatever you want to have happen. But the function will not run if, unless everything is as it should be. And you can also have post conditions. After this function runs, these things must be true. And you can <coughs> turn those things on and off. They they help document the program. They make it clearer what the expectations are. They provide much better information than type systems do for how the, what the expectations of the program are and how everything should work. I would really like to see these come back. I think this is a brilliant idea that somehow got lost. And I hope they become a standard feature of the next language, the language that hopefully soon replaces JavaScript. Security is a really big concern. Um, the, the world has gotten so interconnected and we are all out there where everything now is exposed and our languages were not designed for this environment. The next language should do a much better job of security of allowing us to, to write secure programs that we can all have confidence in. We, yeah, and we tend to go in the opposite direction, that we look for features that are fun or expressive or fashionable without considering their impact on the security of what we're trying to do. And it turns out now, security is the most important aspect of our programs. It's more important than performance. It's more important than anything. We've got to do better with security. And in order to do that, we need better tools. We need better programming languages. We need much better control over distribution. So all of our programming languages since Fortran have been mainly concerned with sequential processing. And 
one damn thing after another. And, you know, even looking at new languages with only a couple of famous exceptions, that's pretty much still what they're concerned with. Uh, Erlang being maybe the best example to the contrary. We need, and go would be another one. So we need a better control over distribution because our programs aren't just running in one CPU sequentially until finished. Our programs want to get distributed over many cores within a machine and run effectively in that space. And the programs also want to distribute themselves over many machines over the internet. And our languages are all so sequential, they don't do a good job of this. So the next language should give us much better tools for managing distribution. <coughs> so that brings me to the end. Before we go, I just want to admonish you, please be careful out there. The web is cluttered and full of errors. <laughs> Thank you and good night. So we have time for questions. Go ahead. We have time for questions if anyone has a question. Yes. Okay, so you know the one where you talk about if and feed. Would you say that now that I have two more letters that I need to look at instead of curly braces, there's more cognitive load in me looking at it as compared to, uh, you know, when I look at a curly brace, I'm like, oh, okay, I'll just look all of this out. I don't know if you at home heard this sorry, sorry question. Uh, he's asking if you have the phi on the end of an if, is that more work to read the two letters than to read the one curly brace? Yeah, that's a sorry. No, no, it's not. It's actually easier. Yes. Reading is not not hard. Understanding is hard, and it actually aids understanding. Anybody else? Yes. So, uh, as you said, like you were anticipating a new language that would uh, take over JavaScript. So, how long do you think that JavaScript uh, would be alive for how many uh, more years to come? Yeah. So, how much longer are we going to be stuck with JavaScript? People still write COBOL programs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, a while ago, I met a, a programmer who was working at UCLA, and he was writing in COBOL. I said, "Wow, that must be like working in Colonial Williamsburg." Or <laughs> <laughs> turn the butter. Uh, <laughs> hard Lower hard hat. Hat. Uh, so I, I'm certain that when Brendan Eich designed JavaScript, he never imagined that it would have lasted as long yeah. as it did. That the expectation was that, that when Netscape failed, the language would have gone with it, and it didn't. Um, JavaScript saved the web from extinction, yes. and as a <coughs> result of that, the web is saving JavaScript from extinction. So there's <laughs> this thing going on there. Yeah. So. I don't know that we're actually going to get rid of it, but I'm, I'm a programmer, so I'm necessarily an optimist. Right? You have to be an optimist to be a programmer. Or a pacifist. No, it's true, because you can't do debugging unless you're an optimist. <laughs> and that's why we can't schedule, right? Because we're optimists. Uh, how long is it going to take that? Uh, <laughs> So there's no sign out there that JavaScript is in any danger of being replaced by anything. But being an optimist, I have to believe we can do better than that. Uh, if only for our kids, right? You know, <laughs> if JavaScript is the last language, that would be really sad. You know, we've got to do better for the kids. <laughs> the kids deserve a better legacy than JavaScript. So oh, that's what transpilers are for. <laughs> Transpiling doesn't fix the worst things in JavaScript. It doesn't fix the number system, for example. True. So we need a, a, a new, better language. Thank you. I don't know who's going to make it. Maybe one of you, some brilliant man or woman, is going to figure this out. And I'm hoping that the rest of us have enough wisdom to recognize, yes, that's it. We need to figure out how to get this into the internet. Yeah. Uh, do you think uh, the languages or the, the, the to be language that you're talking about uh, should be far different than something like a Swift or a Golang, which is for a little different purpose, especially the ones that we use for web development or on the web and the base. Should it be different than, 
general preference uh, language. Do you, or do you foresee them becoming the language that we you were talking about? Uh, no, those languages can't because they've got too much of the old baggage. You know, they, there's too much clutter in those languages as a result of when and how they were created. We need a new language which is created without the clutter. And reasonable people can disagree on what the clutter is, but if anyone needs to understand what the truth is, they can just ask me. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah. The, the other part of the question is, should, should, should that thought of building a language for the browser solution be very different than how we do it for something on the server side? Um, it just runs programming and interaction. Well, I, I think the distinction should be much less. So one of the most interesting things to happen recently on the server side is we now have JavaScript on both ends. And we, we thought that one of the benefits of that would be that you could be running the same code on both ends of the network. Mm -hmm. And we haven't really figured out how to do that well. But I, I think there's still a benefit in that. That right now, it's we've got a sequential program on that end and a sequential program on that end. So I think Erlang had the right idea in that we want to bust things up into lots of, of uh, lightweight processes. Lots of them. Some of them are running here, some of them are running there. They're all talking to each other across the internet. That's the architecture that we need to get to. And there's no language yet that does that. Erlang comes close, but it was designed a long time ago, and it has accumulated a lot of clutter as well. What do you think of Elixir as opposed to Erlang? I have not looked at Elixir enough to, to have an opinion, but it's running on the Erlang machine, and so it's still going to be constrained by that. I, I, again, I haven't looked at it closely enough to know how big a problem it's going to be. But I do know looking at Scala, there is so much brilliance in Scala, but I can also see how it was limited by having to run in the JDM. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wish Scala had been brave enough to, to be fresh and new. Yeah. 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 Um, they made a choice, and it was a reasonable choice. They thought we can get a lot of leverage if we go on the JDM, and that was right, but it came at a terrible, terrible cost. Yes. I'm sorry? Uh, as far as I know, nobody in the world is using Tech 64. I <laughs> uh, could be wrong about that, but no one has notified me that they're using it. <laughs> so you, you talk about callbacks and promises. What's about the new kit on the block, uh, like the um, observables? Um, do you have an opinion about them? The, the new series so who? The new hey, observables. I think he's talking uh, about RxJ. Uh, yeah. RxJS. Yeah, so uh, Rx is really clever stuff. I like it a lot. Um, I do not think it should be built into JavaScript because it doesn't need to. It works really well as a library. Things that work well as libraries should be libraries. It doesn't need to be in a language. But you know, if it solves a problem that you have, then that's great. For, for those of you who don't know, Rx is a package that came out of Microsoft that allows for the composition of event streams. It's <coughs> very, very clever stuff. I don't think it's the solution to all problems, but there are definitely problems that are solved by that tool. So would you tend to argue for that as opposed to async and await in ES2017, or do you think, see them as complementary? Uh, they're complementary, although I really don't like async and await. The, the thing that they're trying to do is to make our asynchronous programs look like synchronous programs so we don't have to understand how asynchronicity works. Right. And I think that's going in exactly the wrong, dire wrong direction. I want to be going more in the Erlang direction where we're splitting things up and, and spinning it all over the universe, not trying to figure out how to force a single monolithic program to, to leave time. So I think it's the wrong model. Asynchronous. It's really important that we understand understand asynchronicity because it turns out the universe is asynchronous and we're all asynchronous. And so we need to somehow figure out how to adapt to that. And I think async and await are crippling, that you, you will not understand asynchronicity if you have those crunches.
Yes. So I think you emphasized on uh, getting rid of clutter from, from JavaScript. And I was quite surprised you never mentioned classes. What do you think about them? Oh, yeah. syntax for classes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't use it, so I, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, you're right. I, I think it was a mistake having put classes into the language. Um, you know, about half of the stuff that gets added to the language was obviously a mistake, and the other stuff we're not so sure about yet. <laughs> right. Yes. What is your take on uh, Golang's differ functionality? Uh, what do I think about Golang? Golang's differ. Is the functionality got differ in Golang? Uh, I I don't know that feature. Generally, I like uh, Go a lot. I, I think there's some brilliant stuff in there. That it's also an interesting experiment of trying to deal with um, their their Go routines. I think are not quite. I don't like them quite as much as the uh, Erlang processes, but that's definitely in the right direction. They clean up the syntax a lot compared to the C languages. I, I think their syntax is quite lovely, um, but I don't think they do the distributed thing as well as Erlang does. But it's definitely in the right track. It's not just one thing after another. So I let go a lot. Yes. How about exploring more of the GPU-based computers? Because almost half of the things you hate, like emails, bars, and so on, is things that GPU hates as well. Um, yeah, it, I've not been in GPUs for a long time. And I, I think it's very different than what I remember. So I'm, I'm not qualified to talk about languages or GPUs. But their model is so radically different than what we're doing in, in the application languages. Um, so yeah, we, we need better GPU languages for sure. And I, I don't know that one language could do very well. I, I think it needs to be more specialized. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you think if in the next version of this or future language we get rid of this clutter and baggage, there will be a substantial uh, increase in performance or a reduction in weight, reduction in errors? Or do we just move to write writing better interpreters like probably Google does on that? Um, being an optimist, I think that if we can get rid of clutter, then we become better programmers. That will stop tripping over stuff that's in the way, and we can focus on making good programs. Um, and I, I see we, I see us wasting so much time on clutter. You know, it causes errors, and we refuse to understand what caused the error, and so we keep making those mistakes over. And it makes it degrades our communities, makes it harder for us to work together, harder to share code. You know, someone imports some code into a project and it's written in a different style than everybody else, then everybody gets angry. And, and it'd be better if we could just design a really good style and have it be enforced by the language, and we all just do that, and we stop wasting time about stuff that doesn't matter. So I'm hoping that a new language could accomplish that. Then there's the question of how long does the language stay free of clutter? How long will it take us to start putting the clutter back in? Because we, <laughs> we, we do that. Um, and who knows? Probably a week or two. <laughs> My favorite ES6 feature, proper tail calls. Proper tail calls were invented in Scheme. Mm -hmm. They're the, the really important idea that was in Scheme that didn't get it in, get into JavaScript immediately. We need that in order to, to do functional programming in JavaScript. And I'm so glad we got into ES6. And I'm really annoyed that it hasn't been implemented yet. So if you're a browser maker, <laughs> Get on it. We need the proper tail calls. Please get that done. Pronto. Yes. Uh, what's your opinion on the open of JavaScript frameworks to the current day Yeah. What's my opinion on popular JavaScript frameworks like React and Angular and yeah. crap like that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
very fortunate that I get to work on what I want to work on, so I don't have to deal with any of that stuff. So I don't know. I have no opinion because I've never used it. slide you were saying that we need to make the compiler faster and then the next slide you were saying that we now we have uh, like terabytes of RAM in our pocket. Is it two slides kind of kind of contradict to with, with each other? No, but no. Uh, but, uh, the point was that there were design decisions made in language design based on how much memory was available for the compiler to run in. You know, that doesn't matter anymore. That's a non-issue. So we should not be adding or removing features of languages based on what we can do in 16K. We just, it doesn't matter anymore. We should allow, we should design the languages instead in terms of what helps us write good programs. That, that's a much more important thing. All right, well, thank you very much again for coming out. Right, then.